Hello, everyone. This hour on Verbling, the next in my great short story series. This is part three of A Good Country People by Flannery O'Connor. If you want to know more about the culture of your second language and its literature, then great short stories will do that for you. Read classic short stories in different genres from yesterday and today, and participate in class discussions about their artistic, historical, and social contexts. So, that's a bit about my class. Here's a little bit about me. I'm John Eric, your verbling teacher for this hour, and I'm an American teacher, hanging out from Lisbon, Portugal, to bring you this class. And here are three quick rules to help you participate. Remember to turn off, tune in, and open up. That means turn off your microphone when you're not speaking. Try to keep it off so we can keep the background noise to a minimum. Rule number two is tune in to the new words and activate what you learn in the beginning of class by using it as actively as you can at the end in the conversation or activity that we do. Basically, use what you learn as actively as possible so that I can give you feedback and that way you will learn. Rule three, open up to your classmates. Relax and have fun. We're all here to learn. And this is a safe and respectful place to practice your English. And oh, by the way, at the end of class, I'll give you a set of links where you can get in touch with me. You can follow me on Verbling to see my upcoming classes, read a tweet, chat with me on Facebook or Google Plus, watch a class or an old sorry, watch an old class or a video on my YouTube channel, or even schedule a private class with me directly. <clears throat> so. That's a little bit about me, and now I want to know a little bit about you. First of all, let's get the light working here. Hopefully, you can see me. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with my hair. I'll try to move it over. I'll try to put the camera on the text so you don't have to look at my face. Maybe that's a better option. Um, by the way, <coughs> there we go. When you open the text... Oh, let me give you a copy of it if you don't have it in the... Oh, someone looks like they already put it there. Let's see if that's the same one. Yes, that is. Okay, so if you open that... If you open that... There you go. Thank you, Redneck. But uh, I'm going to put also a link there because with yours I wasn't able to click on it. But this one I can... Um, so, if you click on that, you'll get to this page, Short Stories 3, O'Connor's Good Country People. Yesterday we read a quick quote about Flannery O'Connor and the idea of grace. And uh, we defined it as, I think Nadine was saying that it can be some kind of pardon. Uh, forgiveness or some sort of uh, a gift in some way. It obviously has a religious overtone. And the religious aspect of her stories is there, but it's not explicit. It's in the background. Like a lot of what's going on in the stories, the time period of the 1950s, the setting of the South, and the transition from uh, a traditional way of life to a modern way of life. So she's kind of a modernist in her own way, but quite different than the other ones. Different than, say, some of her contemporaries of the time. We read Hemingway already, and there's a lot to compare between the two. So what I'd like to do is jump right back into the text after we do a little, maybe a quick summary of what we've read so far, because this is kind of a long, short story. So, and it's maybe not so easy. It's quite advanced. So, um, there's Nadine. Hi, Nadine. How are you? Hi. How are you? Now you now it says Nadine, so I know what to call you. Because <laughs> before yes. it said okay. Um, okay. So I think it would be good. By the way, where is everyone else, Nadine? <laughs> well, well, you're all alone. Why is that? Where are I all the know. other kids? Ah, here we go. Here's someone. Maybe they, they, maybe they're eating some sweets, you know. 
or something. Mm. Maybe. Maybe. Giuseppe, how are you? Hello, John. I'm fine. Thanks. Excellent. Um, well, let's do this. Um, Nadine, are you there? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, see, now I'm confused. You're the Nadine from the Philippines, Nadine, right? <laughs> no. Ah, uh, that's why it was. Because there's another Nadine, but she has a different name in the on her, um, you know, on her, what are these things called down here, your icon with your picture. So that's why I was confused. So you're not the same Nadine. You're a different yes. Nadine. Where are you yes. from? I am from Saudi Arabia. You're from Saudi Arabia. Oh, OK. Yes. So I was talking about a different Nadine earlier. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So I think, I think both of you weren't here uh, for the last part. So we need to, we need to uh, summarize or else it's going to be kind of confusing. So OK. 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 So if you open that text document, <clears throat> we've got text in blue and red. Blue was from the first class, and red was from the class yesterday. OK. So I hear other people coming in. Ah, there's Andre. He was here, and Yuki. OK, good. So the blue text. Uh, which was paragraphs one, two, three, four, one to four. Uh, okay. Um, so this was the introduction to the story. We basically found out about five characters: Mrs. Freeman, okay. uh, her daughter, Joy. No, no, Mrs. Freeman. Sorry, is uh, the hired help on this farm that we're reading about. Uh, Mrs. Hopewell and her daughter Joy. Uh, Mrs. Hopewell is the owner of the farm. Joy is her daughter. And Joy, we find out, is unusual in some, in some different ways. First of all, she has an artificial leg. So she can't really walk, or she has trouble walking. And she's described as a hulking girl. She's a big blonde. She's not a little dainty southern belle. So, she doesn't quite fit the stereotype of your of your southern young lady. Mrs. Freeman was hired on the farm, and she's got two daughters that are very sort of. We get the idea that they're very delicate and petite, and uh, and she seems to she makes fun of their names, <clears throat> so she's kind of making fun of something about southern culture too. Uh, and we find out that Mrs. Freeman who's described like a truck in the beginning. She's sort of like on autopilot. Uh, she's a loud, difficult woman. Uh, she always has to be right. And Mrs. Hopewell uh, likes her because she's called Good Country People. And that's the title of the story. So all of this was just basically character and a little bit of background. OK. OK, so that was, par that was one to four. Yesterday, we continued reading. And uh, I could, uh, I don't know, who was here yesterday? I don't want to keep speaking. So uh, did we learn anything new yesterday? I think, uh, Yuki, you were here. Andre, I don't remember if you were here yesterday or not. Yes, yes, I was. Ah, OK. So besides being introduced to the characters and finding out a little bit about them, um, did we learn anything new? In paragraphs five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, and thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, we stopped at fifteen. We got, we got pretty far actually. So, do you remember any details from yesterday that you could share, Andre or Yuki? Uh, yes, actually, the story described uh, uh, Mrs. Hoffel, uh daughter. Right. Um, who is who? Who has uh, unfortunately the artificial leg, and uh, the story described her personality. So, mm -hmm. so did we learn anything new yesterday that we didn't know from the first class? One thing new was her name, right? Yeah. What does she but, like to be called? Uh, actually, yeah, she like uh, to be called Joy. She likes to be called Joy, or she doesn't like to be called Joy? She actually, 
She her legal her. name. It's right. She changed, yeah, because her legal name was another Holga. Holga, I think. Her legal name was Joy, and she changed it to Holga. Remember, it's the exact opposite. She changed yes. it to Holga. And how does her mother feel about that, Yuki? Is her mother happy about that? Uh, no, mama, ma mother, fi uh, not to feel happy. Mother, um, mother, firstly, mother named her as uh, I don't remember. Her name was Joy. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Joy's name, Joy's real name. Uh, no, no, that is her real name. Joy is her real name. Holga was her legal name that she changed uh, yes, with, right, without permission. Legal name, yeah. Right. And is her mother happy about the name change? No, mother no, no mother don't feel happy. Her about, mother about her her mother doesn't feel happy. Her mother doesn't feel happy. Uh -huh. yes. Don't forget her mother. Her mother right. don't don't feel happy about changing her, her name. Okay, I agree with you so far. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just trying to point, think if there's any... Okay, and we know that she doesn't feel happy because it says in paragraph 14, when Mrs. Hopewell thought the name... When Mrs. Hopewell thought the name Holga, or when she thought about the name Holga, she thought or imagined the whole of a battleship. So the name for her is really ugly. And... and we kind of we have to wonder if that isn't the reason that Holga or Joy changed her name, because she feels ugly. Maybe she changed it to to sound ugly as well. Yes. Uh, uh, what else do I want to say? Anything else? Uh, well, I think that was really about it. I mean, so it's a little bit hard to summarize what happened because there's no action yet in the story. It's all character background. And this very rich, rich, nuanced uh, sort of description. So you really can't do justice to it by by describing it or summarizing it. You really have to read it to to get the feel for it. Okay, so let's pick up in paragraph 16. By the way, some of the the formatting, I didn't have a chance to format the entire story. So we might move on on page eight. And it'll look a little weird, but I'll try to fix it later. The formatting is, I uh, wasn't able to copy and paste it with the right format. But anyway, let's pick up on page 16 and see what we can learn about our characters now. Okay? So, um, what do you think, Giuseppe? Want to start us off on the bottom of page 5 in paragraph 16? Okay. Go for she, it. Okay. She did not. Uh... She did not call. She did not call for call her that in front of Mrs. Mrs. Hopewell, who would have been in chase, but incensed. 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 Out. Incensed. By the way, just two things. She did not call her that. That is the word Holka, right? Because they're talking about her real name. Just so you know, that's what the, that's what that refers to. Okay. And incensed? Do you know what that means? Incensed? No, never heard before. <laughs> incensed is a way of saying extremely angry. Incensed. Incensed. Very angry. Very angry. Fu furious. That's another way to say it. Go ahead, sorry. But when she and the girl happened to, um, happened to be out of... Uh, the house together, she would say something and add the, name, add the name Olga to the end of it. And the big spectacled... Spectacled. Spectacled, spectacled. here we mean glasses. It's an old way of saying glasses. Plastics? Gla glasses. Glasses. O Oculus. How do you say it in Italian? Glasses. Oculus. The uh, things you wear on your eyes are what? <laughs> Okay. Ah, uh, What's the word specchio. in Italian? Specchio. Specchio in Italian? Really? Wow. If you say you show some uh, yourself in in the glass. No, no, no. I mean, 
you can wear contact lenses in your eyes, or you can wear glasses, right? I, I don't wear either. What's the word for that in Italian? Glasses. In Italian, and in Portuguese, it's oculus. In Italian, I don't know. Uh, glasses or glasses? Glasses, like when glasses. you're to, to read, to read. Uh, well, glasses in Italian means um, bicchiere. It's a... Um, no, 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 but I don't mean those kind of glasses. I don't mean bicchieri. I mean glasses to read with. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. No, no, but I'm not saying anything complicated. Hold on a second, because I think this might be a little bit confusing, but it's easy. Hold on just a second here. Um, I'm just saying in Italian because I want to know if... Ocale. <laughs> what is it? Ocale. Is that right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ocale. Yeah, oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, yeah. ah, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. 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 I, don't know, I don't know Italian, but... Uh, the CH oh, in yeah. Italian... Dictionary, yes. the, the CH in Italian is like a K. It's a K. Sorry. So, sorry. Okay, so oh, yeah. those kind of glasses. Occhiale. Those kind of glasses. So spectacles is an old way of saying glasses, occhiale. I don't know in Japanese, but you can tell us, Yuki, if you know. <coughs> uh, and I don't know in Russian either. Or are you, you speak Russian, right, Andre? Yes. Okay. What is it in Russian? Ochki. Ochki. Oh, it's yeah. almost the same. It's almost the same. How about that? Now we know. And Nadine, how do we say it in Arabic? Navara. Oh, my God. That's really different. <laughs> No, Nabara, is that right? Nabara, yes, yes. With a B or a V? Not this or that. <laughs> oh, neither? Oh. No, sorry. The pronunciation is a little bit uh, difficult in Arabic. It's Nabara. Novara. Novara. Yes, like that. In the middle, oh, okay. like that. Nabara. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> if nothing else, we learned how to say glasses in several languages today. So that means it's a good lesson. It's a multi-language okay. task. Anyway. This is good. Anyway. Joy yes. Olga would scold and read them as if her privacy Gow. had been entrapped, entrapped, entrapped upon. She considered... Entra it, okay, so wait, back up, back up, back up. Scow? Repeat. Scow. Scowl. Scowl. Redden. Redden. Redden means to become red, like red in the face. Intruded. And, and intruded upon. Intruded upon. Okay. I, I need you to put that into plain English for me, Giuseppe. Because intruded these are... Upon. Intruded upon. Intruded upon. Yeah. So... What does that sentence mean in plain English? Do you understand scow? You would scow. No. These are these are sort of poetic poetic sounding words. That's why. Apparently in Italian Cipiglio. Does that sound right? Cipiglio? Cipiglio. Cipiglio. Is that right? Does that make sense? No. <laughs> no? No. I'm looking at Google Translator. Uh, okay, forget that. Scow. Um, give me a second here. Is it like uh, feeling uh, embarrassed or something? Huh? Scowl is the same as frown. Look, look, look at uh, the screen. Uh, so, uh, not exactly frown, but more angry. So, kind of like, kind of an angry face like this. I'm scowling. Sort of uh, like that. That's my mm -hmm. scowl. What do you think? Is that a good scowl? No, I'm not scowl. <laughs> so something like that. Something like that. A scowl. Uh, it's an expression that... An angry face. An angry expression. So, this sentence has a lot of sort of poetic sounding words, but let's make sure it's clear. What, what, what's actually happening? Let's, let's just reverse and make sure the sentence is clear. She would say something, actually, from the very beginning. She did not call her that, the name Holga, in front of Mrs. Hopewell. So this is Mrs. Freeman, the hired help, 
on the farm, the one who's, who's tending the fields, or whose husband is tending to the fields. Mrs. Freeman did not call her Holga in front of Mrs. Hopewell, who would have been incensed. But when she and the girl happened to be out of the house together, she would say something and add the name Holga to the end of it. <clears throat> and the big spectacle Joy Holga would scowl and redden as if her privacy had been intruded upon. So, does, does Joy, or Holga, whatever we want to call her, is she happy about being called Holga by Mrs. Freeman or not? If she if she scowls like her privacy has been intruded upon, someone has 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 trespassed on her on her property. So is she happy about it? No. No, she's not no. happy about it. Uh, she she emphasizes uh, is angry. Is, she's uh, you're right. She's angry because she she reddens. She gets red she in the red, face. Yeah. She, red in face. she regards it to over over humiliate, humiliated. Maybe, yeah, maybe she's sort of humiliated. It could be. I'm not quite sure about why she's unhappy with this. <laughs> maybe I maybe I misunderstood the, the last paragraph because I thought that she was okay with that. But anyway, seems like she's not very happy with that. She considered that her personal affair. Oh wait. Sorry, there's a problem in the there's a problem in the there's a problem in the formatting. There we go. Now it's fixed. Okay. So she can she she considered that name her personal affair. So apparently when she changed her name, she was uh, asserting her identity. So no one else can call her that. That's that's the idea that I'm getting at least. Okay, sorry Giuseppe, go ahead. She had arrived at at uh and it uh, first purely on the basis of, of its ugly sound, and then the full genius of its fits and fitness had struck her. She had a vision of the name working like the ugly sweet in Vulcan, who stayed in the furnace and the two home. Presumably, the goddess, the goddess, had so, to come when. Hang on, called. just sorry. Hang on, just one second. I have to open the door for my cat, or he's going to destroy my room. Give me one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I don't keep his litter box inside the room, <laughs> so he better go out or there may be a problem. I'm sorry. The Vulcan, yes. Vulcan, who stayed in the furnace and to whom, presumably, the goddess had to come when called. She saw it as the name of her highest creative act. One of her minor triumphs was that her mother had not been able to turn her dust into joy, but the greater one was that, that she had been able to turn it herself into Olga. However, Mrs. Freeman's release for using the name only irritated it. her. It was, it was as if Mrs. Freeman's bead is still pointed, eyes... So here, the, here, these are three words that are describing her eyes. They're beady and they're steel, steel pointed. Steel, steel pointed. like the metal, steel. And beady is like the way you would describe the eyes of a rat. Beady eyes. Like mm -hmm. little little dark dots, like a rat's eyes. Beady, steel-pointed eyes. If someone has beady, steel-pointed eyes, uh, do they seem like warm, <laughs> nice human beings? So uh, how are we describing Mrs. Freeman here? Maybe she looks... Uh heavy or uh, um, how can I say she she fixed a point and uh, what temperature we, we, is what temperature is steel mm. if you touch steel how does it feel hard it feels hard but at what temperature does it feel temperature temperature, temperature. hot or cold cold what, cold it's metal so she's a cold person 
and her eyes are like a rat. You know, not a mouse, a nasty, dirty rat. So she's cold, and she's like an animal, like doesn't really think, something like that. And she's got this blank look in her eyes. So, so steel-pointed eyes means that she has a cold stare, cold, no emotion, just so it's clear, okay? Clear? Not clear? Yeah. yeah. Does that be clear? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I have to leave it for a moment. Okay, okay. No I will be back uh, in a moment. Thank you. We'll miss you. <laughs> I'll finish the paragraph for Giuseppe. Um, so, it was as if Mrs. Friedman's beady, steel-pointed eyes had penetrated far enough behind her face to reach some secret. So this is something about, you know, using her name and and Joy's or Holga's privacy. Something about her seemed to fascinate Mrs. Freeman, and then one day Holga, Holga realized that it was the artificial leg. Mrs. Freeman had a special fondness for the details of secret infections, hidden deformities, assaults upon children, of diseases she preferred the lingering or incurable. And Holga had heard Mrs. Hopewell give her the details of the hunting accident, how the leg had been literally blasted off, how she had never lost consciousness. Mrs. Freeman could listen to it any time as if it had happened an hour ago. Mrs. Freeman sounds like a, a, a really wonderful person, doesn't she? She sounds great. I think, yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> she likes she, sounds, she likes to pay attention to people's problems, it seems. Yeah. So remember this story is called Good Country People. And so far everyone we've met has some kind of interesting trait. Interesting. Uh Mrs. Freeman doesn't sound like a very good person. She's obsessed with hearing about the suffering of children. She wants to know all the details. So these are a very interesting cast of characters. Well, Nadine, why don't, why don't you take 17 for us on page 8? Oh, 6, sorry, page 6. 17. Paragraph 17. Okay. When Holger stepped into the kitchen in the morning, she could walk without making the awful nose but she made it. Mr. Hopper was certain because it is was ugly. Ugly sounding. sounding. One word. Ugly sounding. Ugly sounding. What, what's she, this noise we're talking about? The noise of what? What do you think? She, she didn't have to make the noise, but she chose to make it. What was this noise we're talking about? Holga stumping. Do you know what stumping her, is? Yes, her feet, the sound for her feet when she mm. walk. Exactly, but she doesn't have feet, <laughs> right? She has an artificial leg. So it's the sound. First of all, if you're missing part of your limb, right? Okay. If I don't have a, if I don't have a hand, this is called a stump in English. Stump, the, okay. Right. The part that's missing, what's left is called the stump. And also, stump, in this case, is a sound. The sound of something uh, hitting the floor, like, like, a, like a, you know, like, like we think about pirates with a wooden leg, that sound of the wood hitting the floor. So she doesn't have to make the sound, but she chooses to make it, right? She could walk without making the awful noise, but she made it on purpose. So she's always there. <laughs> well, at least that's what her mother thinks. Mrs. Hopewell was certain because it was ugly sounding. So she's doing it on purpose. At least her mother thinks that. Okay, go ahead. She glanced... She glanced... Glanced. She, she glanced at them and did not speak. Mr. Hobby will be in her red... Kimono. Kimono. What's a kimono? Her, uh, What's oh, it is um, uh, Japanese, um, <laughs> like robe <laughs> or something like that. Y Yuki's wearing a kimono right now. Yuki, turn on your camera. Let's see the kimono. 
Uh, no. Oh, you're not? Oh, you're embarrassed. Don't, don't be embarrassed. Don't, don't be embarrassed. I don't have a Oh, okay. <laughs> don't be embarrassed, Yuki. We don't care how you dress in your personal life. It's okay. A kimono is like a really ornamental robe, right? Yes. yes. Is it a? It's a. Is it a? It's a traditional dress. Yes. It is a tra traditional Japanese cloth. Right. Um, it's not only a uh, woman, uh, oh, man, really? men oh, or also was... wear. I thought it was only also for women. it is not 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 so well known that uh, Japanese man, men also wear the kimono. Well, some Japanese men are strange. So <laughs> no, kimono is very <laughs> <laughs> very convenient it, and present, to, uh, especially uh, in summer. It is very cool. Do they look different for men than they look for women? Are the kimonos for women no, designed um, differently? Uh, men's kimono is uh, quite different ah. from uh, yes, uh, women's. Uh, in in figure and color also color is color is more more hum, more um, more dark. Mm -hmm. Not darker? not so colorful, dark darker and and not so colorful, um, more um, so, solid. <laughs> but what? Sorry. Ah, uh, um, darker more, and what? Da dark and uh, not so colorful. Uh, darker and, so, and and duller. So duller. Dola. Dull is the opposite of bright. You mean a little bit duller? Uh, not dola. so bright. Yes. Dol, so D-U-L-L, Dol. Uh-huh. Dola. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, in the story, Mrs. Hopewell would be wearing a, her red kimono. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a woman in the South in the 1950s. I wonder why she's wearing a red kimono. Let's, let's see if we can find out. Nadine, tell us why she's wearing her red kimono. Go ahead. Okay. With her hair uh, tied around her ha head, in the regions. She will be sitting at uh, the table, finishing her breakfast. And Mr. and Mrs. Friedman, Freeman will be uh, hanging by her elbow. Elbow outward from the Re refrigerator. Refrigerator. Oh, there is this is it. Refrigerator. 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 Right. Looking down at the table. Holger always puts her eggs on the stove to, to boil. 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 To, boil mm -hmm. to boil. And then to and uh, then stood over them um, with her arms folded. And Mr. Hopeful would look at her uh, a kind of indirect? Indirect? Indirect. Indirect, sorry. Mm -hmm. Gaze. Gaze. Gaze means to stare at someone. If I gaze at you, I look at you too long, okay. looking at someone intensely. With the desire or no? No, no, not necessarily. Just looking too long. Looking like a staring. Like staring, right. Okay. If you if you read film theory, cinema theory, they talk about the gaze. The gaze. The idea of of what we look at, and that film is like the gaze of people. So there's not necessarily any desire there. You can have desire, <laughs> but here, she's Mrs. Hopewell, or uh, this, this, this is Holga always put her eggs on the stove to boil and then stood over them with her arm folded, and Mrs. Hopewell would look at her, a kind of indirect gaze. Mrs. Hopewell, her mother, right? would look at her, but not directly. She'd look at, at her kind of at the corner of her eye to not be too obvious. So she's staring at her, probably disgusted by her, 
because she's always trying to make herself ugly and making lots of noise, like showing showing everyone that she's there and that she's different. So I think that's the idea. Okay, finish it up for us, Nadine. A kind of uh, direct gaze divide between her and Mr. Freeman, and would we'll think that if she would only keep herself up a little. She would not be bad looking. There was nothing wrong with her face. That pleasant experience would expression. not help. Expression. Experience. Expression. Expression. Sorry. Expression would not help Mr. Hopewell. Would not help. Period. Next sentence. Mrs. Hopewell. So there's nothing wrong with her face that a pleasant expression, like a smile, would not help. In other words, Mrs. Hopewell, the mother, does not accept her daughter as she is. She's trying to say that if only she would just smile, maybe she could be, you know, she wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> but apparently she thinks her daughter is pretty nasty. So she doesn't really accept her the way she is. Okay, and Mrs. Hopewell says what, Nadine? Mr. Hopewell said that people who looked on the bright side of things would be beautiful even if they were, were not. Or so they are Mrs. not. Even if they were not. Were, were not. not. Were not, yes. Right. So, Mrs. Hopewell, who is Joy or Holga's mother, um, does she think that Holga is beautiful? Does she think her daughter is beautiful? Just to be clear, Nadine. I don't think so, no. No, she doesn't think her daughter is beautiful. Does she think her daughter could be acceptably attractive? Acceptably? If she made an effort? Uh, yes. Yes or no? Yes, she yes. does. Does Joy or Holga want to be beautiful? or acceptably attractive? Does she want to be, according to her behavior? Uh, think? I think not. Because? You're right. Because? Because. What does she do to make herself unattractive? For example, how does she enter the room? In stem. Yep, she stumps in the room. Stump. So she draws attention to her artificial leg. <laughs> she tries she deliberately makes sure that no one forgets that she's different. She can't she's like unstoppable with this. Um, okay, paragraph eighteen is really short. Uh, I'll read that really quickly. It's short. Whenever she looked at Joy this way, this is the the mother. Whenever she looked at Joy this way, she could not help but feel that it would have been better if the child had not taken the PhD. Remember, Joy is educated, <coughs> or Holga is educated. We'll call her Holga from now on. That's her, that's her legal name. It had certainly not brought her out any, brought her out, made her more extroverted. It hadn't made her more friendly. It had certainly not brought her out any, and now that she had it, there was no more excuse for her to go to school again. Mrs. Hopo thought it was nice for girls to go to school, to have a good time, but Joy had, quote, gone through. Uh, anyhow, she would not have been strong enough to go again. So, wh why do most people get a PhD? <laughs> to, to, <coughs> Most people get a PhD to become specialists in a field, right? Does, does, does Mrs. Hopewell understand that? Why does Mrs. Hopewell think people go to school? She, she said that uh, she, uh, her daughter made an excuse and uh, to, to not socialize and to make it fun. Her daughter, her daughter yes. does she think that women should go to school to have fun or go to school to learn? No, she think, uh, thinks that she, they sh uh, should go to have a good time. Yeah. Exactly. That's not why Joy went there. Joy went there 
because she wanted to be educated. So Mrs. Hopewell doesn't really get it, <laughs> she, right? She lives in a world with good country people where girls should be attractive and they should be, uh, you know, little dainty objects. And Holka is is constantly reminding her that that is just her point of view, right? She's constantly reminding her that she's different. Um, okay, Andre, why don't you take 19 and, yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, the doctors uh, had told Mrs. Hopewell uh, that with the best of care, Joy might see 45. Uh, she had a weak heart. Uh, Joy had made it plain that uh, if it uh, hadn't been for this condition, she would be far from these red hills and good country people. She would be in a university lecturing to people who knew what she was talking about. And Mrs. Hopewell, Hopewell uh, could very well picture her there, looking like a scarecrow and lecturing to more of the same. <laughs> What's uh, a scarecrow? Do you know? Uh, no, actually, no. Anyone know what a scarecrow is out scarecrow in the field? The, the a doll uh, where, where the stand in the, in, in the, uh, the field. Ah, uh, yeah. To, yeah. To prevent to, uh, to scare the crow. Crows. To protect, yeah, to, uh, to protect the crop from, yeah. from bad. Yes. Yeah, specifically the crows. It's a scare crow because you want to scare away the crows so that they don't eat uh, what's in the fields. And so she thinks that she could see her daughter looking like a scarecrow lecturing to a bunch of scarecrows. I really don't. I don't really know what that means, but I can picture it. <laughs> I don't know what she means by that exactly. Sorry. Go ahead, Andre. Uh, okay. uh, here she went about all day in a six-year-old skirt and yellow sweatshirt uh, with a faded cowboy on a horse embossed on it. Embossed. Embossed on it. So embossed like, you know, uh, sewn into the fabric, something like uh, that. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, that's what she means by scarecrow. In other words, <clears throat> instead of dressing like a southern belle, a southern beauty, she dresses in comfortable clothing, right? Because, you know, at the university, people dress informally, and it's not about appearances, it's about the education. So she thinks she looks like a, she dresses in rags. She doesn't care about her appearance. So I guess that's what it means. Okay, keep going. Uh, she thought uh, this was funny. Mrs. Hopewell thought it was idiotic and showed uh, simply that she was still a child. She was brilliant, but uh, she didn't have a grain of sense. It seemed to Mrs. Hopewell that every year she grew less like other people and more like herself, bloated, rude, and squint-eyed. And she said uh, such strange things. To her own mother, she had said, uh, without warning and without excuse, standing up in the middle of the meal with her face purple and her mouth half full, woman, do you ever look inside? Do you ever look inside and see what you are not? God. She had cried, uh, sinking down again and staring at her place, plate. Uh, Mallet branch was right. We are not our, our our own light. We are not our own light. <laughs> <laughs> Malabranch. This is a reference. Nicholas Malabranch was a French Oration priest and rationalist philosopher. So it seems that she studied either philosophy or religious studies if she's going to be quoting Malabranch. Uh, by the way, Andre, what do you think she means by that? Woman, do you ever look inside? Do you ever look inside and see what you are not? God! Malabranch was right. We're not our own light. We are not our own light. What What the hell does that mean, Andre? I can only guess. Uh, Make a from, guess. From the, first, uh, from the first sentence, uh, uh, Holger say, says that... Uh, Maybe she doesn't understand her, and uh, I mean uh, her her inside world. But uh, what does she mean 
about Mellow Branch, uh, about the light. I don't know. Well, Mellow Branch is also in Dante's Inferno. <laughs> so uh, we can only guess. All, all, so you have, you have uh, Dante being led through hell <coughs> by Virgil, meeting, uh, you know, basically meeting all of the uh, all of the philosophers of the, of the day and and judging them, right? So, reading just from Wikipedia here, when Dante and, and Virgil meet Malabranch, right? Uh, hold on a second. The leader of the Malabranch uh, assigns a troop to escort the poet safely to the next bridge. Many of the bridges were destroyed in the earthquake that happened in the death of Christ, which uh, Malacoda describes. So you can also go there if you just Google for it. So the point is, it doesn't matter if we know the details. Uh, the the you know, we are not our own light. The light. It doesn't matter if you uh, if you if you care about the religious aspect. The light is usually the truth, right? We see in the light of day. We ask people to clarify things, to throw light on dark subjects. So. Whatever she's referring to, she's probably trying to say that her mother is lives in darkness, you know, like Plato's allegory of the cave, right? There's some people who live and see the shadow of the flames, and there's some people who understand that the real light is outside the door of the cave. So probably she's trying to say her mother is just lives in this little sheltered world, and any candle for her is is the truth. In other words, uh, just her own perceptions and they're very very limited something along those lines I'm just coming up with a off-the-cuff speculation here um, so if there's any questions by the way please ask uh, this story is long so I didn't rather than prepare lots of things that we're just kind of reading and talking about it as we go along um, Yuki want to take 20 and probably 21 when I get it finished okay Mrs. Hopewell had no idea to this day that brought that one. She had only made a remark, hoping joy we would take it in, that the smile never hurt anyone. The girl had taken the paper in the philosophy, and this left Miss, Mrs. Hopewell at the complete loss. You could say, my daughter is a nurse or my daughter is a school teacher, or even my daughter is a chemical engineer. You could not say, my daughter is a philosopher. That was something that, that had ended with the Greeks and Romans. All day, Joy, all day, Joy sat on her neck in deep chair, reading, reading. Sometimes, she went for walks, walks, but she didn't like dogs or uh, cats or birds or flowers or nature or nice young men. She looked at nice young men as if she could smell their stu stupidity. One day, continue. Yeah, stupidity. Stu uh, sorry, stupidity. Right. Continue. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. One day, Mrs. Hopewell had picked up one of the books, books the guard, one of the books the guard had just put down and opening it at random. She, re she read, science, on the, on the other hand, has, has to assert it, its soberness and seriousness uh, afresh and de declare that it is concerned so solely with what is nothing. How, how can it be for science anything but a horror and a phantasm? If science is right, then one thing stands firm. Science wishes to know nothing to nothing. Nothing of nothing. Nothing of nothing. Nothing of nothing. Such that after all, 
of the strictly sci scientific approach to nothing. We know it by wishing to know nothing of nothing. These words are have, sorry, these words have been under, under, underlined with a blue pencil and they worked, they worked on Miss, Mrs. Hopewell like some evil incantation is in gibberish. Gibberish? She, sorry, gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> She, she shut the book quickly and went out of the room as if she were having a chill. So, why, why did she do that? <laughs> why did she run out of the room? What do you think, Yuki? After she, she read what... Was, she was disappointed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Disappointed? She, maybe she... She, mm, she knew that... that was, uh, she, her mother, her mother, um, haven't, uh, um, she mother, uh, would not, would not, wouldn't understand the... Well, well, hang on a second. Her mother is the one who left the room, right, isn't it? Her mother read this strange quotation about science, yes. right? The words sounded like some evil incantation. Mm -hmm. Incantation is a way to say magical spell. Incantation. Yes. Uh, some evil incantation. <laughs> and she shuts the book and runs out of the room as if she's having a chill. Like, <clears throat> you know, when you see something you don't like and you feel this chill down your spine. So I think it's Mrs. Hopewell who runs out of the room. So... Why do you why do you think she runs out of the room after reading the book? There's no right or wrong. I'm just curious. What do you think? Well, Mrs. Hopewell, Mrs. Hopewell thinks that this is gibberish. What's gibberish? Is that clear? What gibberish is? Uh, gibberish is uh, no, something non nonsense, yeah? Nonsense, yes. right, nonsense. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. she, Mrs. Hopewell thinks girls should be nice, they should be into flowers and young men, and, uh, and they shouldn't be a philosopher because that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And when she reads a little bit of her philosophy, it's all about knowing the nothing of nothing, right? And she has just, this. Just she understand nothing, so <laughs> so she, <laughs> she ran away. <laughs> exactly, she no. understands nothing. Yeah. Yes. She understands nothing, and she gets spooked, like she sees a ghost, right? She gets uh, kind of spooked out, and like she has spook. a chill, something like that. Um, yes. Let me see if uh, let me see if I can. I think I'm just going to read ahead a little bit because we have a bunch of short paragraphs here. I'm just trying to find a good place to stop. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, I know exactly where to stop. Okay, I'm going to read the next section for you a little bit quickly in the time that we have left. And it's a good place to stop because in the last part of the story, not the last part, the, the second half of the story is not action. The second half, sorry, the second half of the story is no longer description, it's action. It's when the sixth and most important character enters. So I'm going to read up to that point, and maybe we can, uh, I don't know if we can do this tomorrow, uh, but I'll, maybe I can change my schedule so that we continue tomorrow. This is a very long story, so the other ones were shorter. But I think it's important that we read the whole thing. I don't know. Um, it's really hard to if I were to cut out parts of the story, I think you'd be missing a lot of important stuff. So I'm just leaving it the way it is. I'm going to read a, a little bit ahead in the next three minutes, and that will leave us to where the the main not the main character, but one of uh, the most important character enters the story. So on we're on 22 paragraph 22 on page eight. This morning, when the girl came in, Mrs. Freeman was on carame. She's thrown up four times after supper, she said, and was up twice in the night after three o'clock. Yesterday, she didn't do nothing but ramble in the bureau drawer 
all she did stand up there and see what what she could run up on. That's my that's my impression of southern <laughs> southern dialect. She's got to eat, Mrs. Hopewell muttered, sipping her coffee. We're on twenty three now. Um, while she watched Joy's back at the stove, she was wondering what the child had said to the Bible salesman. Ah, this is the next character in the story, very important. She could not imagine what kind of conversation she could possibly have had with him. He was a tall, gaunt, hatless youth who had called yesterday to sell them a Bible. He had appeared at the door carrying a large black suitcase that weighted him so heavily on one side that he had to brace himself against the door facing. He seemed on the point of collapse, but he said in a cheerful voice, Good morning, Mrs. Cedars, and, and set the suitcase down on the mat. He was not a bad-looking young man, though he had on a bright blue suit and yellow socks that were not pulled up far enough. He had a prominent he had prominent face bones, I guess that means cheeks, and had a streaky, sticky looking brown hair falling across his forehead. I'm Mrs. Hopewell, she said. Oh, he said, pretending to look puzzled, but with his eyes sparkling. I saw it said Miss the Cedars on the mailbox, so I thought you was Mrs. Cedars. And he burst out into a pleasant laugh. Ha 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 ha. He picked up the satchel. Satchel is a, a bag or the bag of Bibles. He picked up the satchel and under and under cover of a pant when you're out of breath. <gasps> right, because he had to run up the stairs to get to the house. And under cover of a pant, he fell forward into her hall. It was rather as if the suitcase had moved first, jerking him afterwards. So he's carrying this big heavy bag of Bibles and trying to get into the house. Mrs. Hopewell, he said, and grabbed her hand. I hope you're well. And he laughed again. And then all at once his face sobered completely. Sober is the opposite of drunk, right? So if his face sobered, it means suddenly he became very serious. So suddenly, instead of laughing, he sort of sobers up, and he says very seriously. He paused and gave her a straight, earnest look and said, Lady, I've come to speak of serious things. And that is where we're going to leave off for today. <laughs> Come back tomorrow. At the same time, if you'd like to know what the serious things are that the young man is going to speak about and and what the relationship is going to be between him and Holga or Joy, uh, remember, this is a story about good country people. And so far, all the people we've met in this good country place are not exactly the good country people we would expect them to be. So let's find out what happens tomorrow at the same hour. I'm going to change my schedule because I have something else planned for tomorrow, but I'm going to change it so we can continue tomorrow at the same time. Okay? So I hope to see you there. If there's any questions, you can find... Oh, how could I forget? Before I go... Before I go... Okay. If there's, if there's any questions or comments, you can always reach me here at any of these links, and uh, or you can hold off until tomorrow and we can have a little question and answers at the beginning of the class and see how far we get. Okay? I'll be back in about one minute and 30 seconds for the business class, which is probably going to be the last in the unit for how to talk about the career. So come back for that and bye for now, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.